I'd like to introduce um, this is Melanie Rebeck. And this is a resume which is too long to sum up, so I'll just stick with the headlines. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Rebeck um, is a former assistant professor of computer science, uh, founder of the um, cybersecurity agency Radically Open Security, and startup incubator nonprofit ventures for uh, open source. Uh, post growth startups. Please correct me, uh, Melanie, if I should uh, <laughs> rename that. And called uh, one of the nine most innovative women in the European Union in 2017. Um, I'd like to give you the floor, please, Melanie, <laughs> to uh, talk about the um, topic of today was the new cooperative models uh, when building your organization and uh, in line with the social theme of today. Thank you. Thank you so much. So yeah, so thank you, uh, first of all, uh, for the invitation. I'm really happy to talk to you all today about social business models. So uh, basically, you know, when we decide to start uh, some kind of a tech company, so and it doesn't matter what kind of a tech company it is, whether it's just like software or blockchain or you know whatever it is uh, that you all are interested in doing typically the first thing that we do is we go to an incubator and uh, you know if we're at this incubator or some kind of startup boot camp usually the very first thing that we see is a powerpoint slide with a picture of an exponential curve so uh, we're explained, it's explained to us that this is how we are supposed to do things. And our stated definition of success is the exit. In other words, selling your company uh, to a larger one or otherwise uh, IPOing, or in other words, going public on the stock market. So uh, what this means basically is that, uh, of course, if you're trying to start a company that first of all is meant uh, for some kind of purpose to for the long term, <laughs> that uh, you know, if the stated definition of success is selling your company, then of course uh, that makes it really rather difficult to create something like, you know, a modest lifestyle business or you know something that is moderately successful or something that is intended to not be sold. Now, there's an up and coming movement uh, called steward ownership. And these are companies that are actually designed from the very beginning to not be sold. Um, so for example, um, the way that it works is they have, well, it, it, the concept of steward ownership lately has been promoted by something called the Purpose uh, Foundation. And they typically hold uh, one, what's called a golden share uh, in, in a company. And then they basically use this just to be able to veto uh, the sale or otherwise uh, the, the IPO of the company, thus trying to ensure that the company cannot be sold. Now, you would probably ask, well, you know, why do you want to do this? <laughs> well, basically, it's because uh, with this whole, you know, Silicon Valley model of entrepreneurship that we're generally taught, you know, there's three steps. It's always the same three steps. Capital, uh, in other words, basically getting investors, um, scale, which is that exponential curve, and then exit. And um, if you want to do something else, like for example, uh, bootstrap, so you know, start uh, your company without investors, there's actually shockingly few places that you can go to learn how to do this. Now, um, the reason why I'm mentioning all this is because I ran into this myself when I was starting my security company, Radically Open Security. So I have a seven and a half year old uh, security consultancy company. And we are what I would call a not for profit company. What does that mean? So uh, we are registered as something called a fiscal fundraising institution, a uh, fiscal fundsverk the instelling in Dutch. And what this is, is it is actually an archaic fiscal construction from the Dutch church. 
So sometimes a church wants to do a commercial spinoff, then it does, you know, some manner of commercial activity, and that money that's raised goes back to the church again with a tax benefit. Now, uh, a famous example of this is the Language Institute Regina Chaley, otherwise known as uh, the, the Nonnen van Feucht in Dutch, the Nuns of Feucht. And, you know, this in the Netherlands is a very well known language institute. In fact, uh, our queen uh, Maxima learned her Dutch there. And, uh, you know, and basically the prophets then go back to the nuns. That's the way this thing was originally set up. So basically what it is, is it's a construction where 90% of the prophets or more basically have to go to go to, to this church. I decided at a certain point to make my security consultancy company be the church. And then the uh, yeah the church doesn't actually have to be a church. It can be anything uh, called an Anbistechning, which is a foundation that is uh, certified as being for the public good. And uh, basically you can choose any uh, foundation that you want. So I decided to basically make my so-called church the NLNet Foundation. And NLNet is essentially a uh, subsidy uh, organization that has donated for over 20 years, uh, 25 years to open source digital rights and anything for a better internet. <laughs> so um, essentially what that means is that 90% of our profits get donated to NLNet. The last 10% uh, is our cash flow buffer, and that's actually what we need to be able to run a company. Um, with that 90%, in the first six years of my company's existence, we already donated over a half a million euros to NLNet. So that's pretty good. So what we're actually trying to do is we're sort of taking the model of philanthropy, which is typically where, you know, first you get rich and then you donate it. Instead, we're sort of turning that on its head and we're baking that donation into the core of our business. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's basically just trying to get people to think about what's possible with uh, running companies. Similarly, also, uh, you know, we ha have a number of other ways in which we're, we're different. Of course, you know, we, we are a social enterprise. The other ways uh, radically open security uh, is different is that we put really strong emphases on openness, transparency, and open source. So uh, we, uh, for example, um, have this workflow, this penetration testing workflow where we invite customers into our chat rooms and uh, they can overhear every single conversation that our ethical hackers are having. <laughs> we do this because we want to optimally transmit uh, the hacker mindset because uh, security is a, uh, it's a process, it's a mindset. It's not just a set of patches that you get from a pen test report. So um, it turns out that this concept, even though it sounded really weird in the beginning, uh, you know, when I first told people that I was going to start a non not for profit security company, everyone thought I was crazy. But after seven and a half years, we have roughly 40 staff members, we've had close to 150 customers. And uh, yeah, I mean, we've won actually quite a few awards, uh, some, some of which uh, Robert mentioned, but, uh, you know, but um, 50th most innovative SME in the Netherlands, uh, most innovative IT leader in the Netherlands, and also indeed, I was a finalist for the EU Women Innovation uh, Prize. But uh, really, you know, what this validation is about is it is about the business models. So um, three years ago, uh, I also created a not-for-profit startup incubator called Nonprofit Ventures because you know I we sort of made a success out of radically open security, and I wanted to try and help others to be able to do the same because there's nothing inherently you know special about uh, computer security that makes it more suited than other businesses to. Um, you know, run as a not-for-profit business, but I thought, you know, how cool would it actually be if you could use not-for-profit business models for all kinds of other things like education or agriculture or healthcare or, you know, because if you really think about it, I mean, you know, the majority of the world's problems usually come directly or indirectly from business. 
a lot of people would think, oh, but you know, what about social enterprise? You know, isn't that getting us sufficiently far where we need to go? The problem really with social enterprise is that uh, it's too close still to the original Silicon Valley uh, model. You still have the capital scale exit. So basically it's just, you have a variation upon it. So basically rather than VCs, you're, you're sent to impact investors. Uh, you know, you're still more or less supposed to scale. Maybe it's three X instead of 10 X, but all right, you're still expected to grow. And there's still impact exits. In other words, you know, the famous selling your B corporation to Unilever. <laughs> um, but if you really break it down, actually this is not all that different. Impact VCs can say that they have uh, have different intentions, but when push comes to shove, they have exactly the same incentive structures. So typically with uh, VCs, whether impact or commercial, they have a fee structure that's called uh, 2% asset under management. So in other words, a 2% fee on the total amount of money they have in their fund. And also 20% what they call carry. And that's basically a performance incentivization. So in other words, if they can manage to get money from an exit, then 20% of that goes to the investor. Now the impact VCs have exactly the same two and 20 fee structure as the commercial VCs do. So they can say that they're doing it for different reasons and perhaps uh, you know, some of the companies have some kind of a social theme, but at the end of the, at the, end of the day, you're still under pressure to grow uh, exponentially and you're still under pressure to exit, even as a social entrepreneur. Now, if you point this out uh, occasionally, you know, the social enterprise uh, ecosystem gets slightly offended by it, but there's also other parties that are really clearly doing things different. Some examples, for example, that uh, that sort of come to mind is uh, there's one impact VC that is called Snowball Impact Management. And uh, the CEO, uh, Daniela, she started Snowball with basically what's called a cost of service fee structure. So what this means is, first of all, uh, that that perform that twenty percent carry that performance incentivization. This is what embeds the growth imperative. So if you want to really en enable people to build social companies that are not being pushed to grow through the incentive structure that's being used, that you know that performance incentive that has no purpose of being there. So first of all, you, you get rid of that. The second thing also is that what people don't understand is 2% fees sounds like a small number, like two, oh, that's, isn't that small? But what people don't get is uh, that is super highly extractive. And, and that's because of compounding. If you think about the amount of money that you would pay, for example, over a period of 30 years for a 2% mortgage, that sort of starts to give you an indication of uh, how much you wind up paying uh, with 2%. Um, and what a lot of people don't get is like, let's say I wanted to retire. So I put money uh, into a 401k or a IRA or one of these kinds of retirement vehicles. And let's say it had a 2% fee uh, for whoever was managing uh, my IRA. Over the lifetime of a fund, you know, typically around about 30 years, and given the historic performance of the stock market, most people don't realize that two thirds of the returns go to the fund manager, two thirds. So this is how extractive 2% actually is. Now, Snowball basically decided to do things differently. So first of all, they got rid of the, the uh, carry, and second of all, they said, well, actually, you know, rather than this uh, 2%, we're actually just making it cost price. So in other words, what she did is she created a not-for-profit investment fund that actually is very similar to what I did with Radically Open Security and making, a, making it a not-for-profit <laughs> security company. So I think this is really exciting. So basically what, uh, what she basically wound up doing was uh, just making you know, the actual cost price of what it is to run the fund given middle-class salaries and a pension, <laughs> you know, that, that basically is what they are taking. Plus of course, being able to reinvest uh, for the actual uh, you know, operational stability of the vehicle. 
I think, you know, with impact VCs, if they really say that they're about impact, then I think they should put their money where their mouth is. And I think, you know, what, what Snowball is doing is a really excellent example. I think they're a great role model uh, for everyone <laughs> uh, to follow. So, um, you know, and I think we also as, as startup potential startup founders, we also need to, to keep in mind these incentive structures of the VCs that we're dealing with. <laughs> Another thing that a lot of us don't think about, but it's it's sort of another recent uh, development that I also find really inspiring, uh, is the up and coming uh, concept of what's called shareholder activism, <laughs> and uh, this is actually I think really exciting. Um, you have, for example, uh, Exxon Mobil. Uh, you know, this is one of the most toxic, <laughs> horrible uh, companies that is out there. Now, there was a really tiny hedge fund uh, called Engine One, and they basically partnered with, uh, I believe it was the Sacramento, Sacramento Teachers Union or something like that, and their pension fund. And what they did is they basically took 20 million uh, asset under management, with it, which is nothing, absolutely nothing compared to ExxonMobil. <laughs> but what they did, though, is they had uh, bought basically 20 million worth of shares. And then in one of the shareholder meetings, they basically wrote up a shareholder proposal in which they said, you know, ExxonMobil, you know, you're, you really need to get with the times. Oil and gas are just, you know, not where the future's at. Everything is going towards renewables. And uh, anyway, you're losing money by being in the Stone Age. And uh, really, we think that you should re- uh, basically reallocate all of your assets to renewables rather than continuing to explore for gas and oil. Um, the funny thing was they actually managed to convince us some of the larger hedge funds, including BlackRock, and wound up placing three climate activists on the board of ExxonMobil. Basically, so this tiny hedge fund with, with this you know, pension of the teachers union managed to do what I think a generation of climate activists <laughs> did not manage to do. Basically getting these three board members uh, replaced. How you know these climate activists, now that they're on the board of ExxonMobil are actually going to implement changes within the company is the next step. I mean, this is basically a playbook uh, that's still being written. But, uh, you know, I find this to be a really exciting development. Another thing that I also found uh, really quite uh, interesting is that uh, they also started basically what is called a, um, an ETF, basically, uh, basically an exchange traded fund. So what this is, is uh, they, they created basically an index fund for the S&P 500. So an index fund basically means it's it, like if you want to in, invest in the stock market, <laughs> then what you can do is basically you buy this, uh, this, this ETF, which is this uh, fund, and it basically just tracks the stock market. That's all it does. So it, in this particular case, it tracks, uh, you know, the uh, uh, S&P 500 roughly. So um, but what is really interesting about what they're doing here is everyone who buy so 30% of total investments that people make are into index funds. So there's a huge amount of money in this market. And what they're doing is they're taking the votes of the people who invest in this fund, and then they're leveraging these votes for proxy activism. Let me explain why this matters. <laughs> so basically, uh, what a lot of people don't realize uh, is that as a startup founder, let's say I want to IPO my company and then I take it public. People would think, okay, then it's on the stock market and then you need to do what the investors tell you to do. Is that so bad? Well, <laughs> you'll understand why it's so bad once you kind of understand how the voting structure typically works. So once you're public, a large part of who uh, you know winds up buying your shares usually tends to be things like investment funds, pension funds, hedge funds. Now they tend to vote. Now they tend to be really lazy actually about voting. So there's two proxy voting companies, one of which is called um, ISS and the other of which is called Glass Lewis. And those two companies basically have a monopoly on corporate governance globally. So they basically come up with these recommendations for voting, which basically includes 
like approve every extra compensation for the directors or, you know, um, you know, approve all of the stock buybacks, you know, that, that, that usually these hedge funds or whoever is trying to do to basically artificially pump up the price of the shares so they can then dump them and run. Um, you know, this stuff is toxic. This stuff is pulling the value out of the real economy, you know, and rendering these companies unable to do almost anything useful while only enriching the 1%. So these are some of the most toxic, horrible practices that are out there. Now, the brilliance really of what Engine One is doing <laughs> is that uh, they are instead allowing people, it's sort of like giving people a fair trade investment option. So in other words, rather than investing in uh, an index fund with BlackRock, like with iShares or something like that, or Vanguard, uh, instead, what they're doing is they're saying, we are committed to using these proxy votes for things that matter. So the environment, uh, you know, uh, social change, uh, you know, basically anything to, to make actual real lasting and meaningful change. So, um, you know, and it's basically like creating a fair trade product. I mean, similar to what, you know, other social enterprises are trying to do with uh, Tony's or, you know, or something if you want to buy a chocolate bar. But it's basically you allow consumers to choose one thing rather than the, than the other thing. Um, it's the same thing also with radically open security and, you know, how we're putting a nonprofit security company on the market. It just enables, in our case, companies and governments to be able to choose for this security vendor rather than the other security vendor. But by putting this choice on the market, it enables people to sort of vote with their euros on the world that they want to live in. And given how large, uh, you know, in the case of Engine One, the market is, uh, you know, for index funds, the amount of votes that they could collect this way, if they can get even a fraction of the shares uh, away from BlackRock, is huge. <laughs> so, you know, sadly, uh, they're not using a cost price fee structure. So I think that's the, uh, the room for improvement uh, in uh, what Engine One is doing. But I think if you could take uh, basically the idea of this shareholder activism, and, and then combine it with the concept of a uh, not-for-profit uh, cost structure, <laughs> like what Snowball Impact Management uh, has, then to me, this would sort of be what, in my opinion, uh, you know, post-growth finance potentially could look like. And uh, I'm using the term post-growth. Uh, post-growth basically just means um, you know, if we stop growing, <laughs> you know, it, what, what else is going to happen? Because let, let me explain. You have the economy and the economy basically always has to be up and to the right. Okay. The moment that uh, it stops growing, what happens? You get recession and layoffs and suffering and all kind of really bad things. Why is this? It's because there's so much financial extraction happening from the economy that we have to continue growing just to maintain a steady state. But we know by now that this, this growth puts pressure on our planet, this growth puts pressure on the environment, and it is just no longer sustainable. So, you know, the question is then, how do we implement a flat economy that thrives rather than growing? There's a lot of economists out there these days that are talking about questions like this, including Kate Rayworth. Uh, she has a really great book called Donut Economics that I would highly recommend um, to anybody who's interested in these kinds of topics. Um, but the point is, you know, if we want to build a flat economy, we need to first understand, you know, to build a post-growth economy, we need to understand how to build a post-growth business. So the businesses with a post-growth business, the whole idea is we are not extracting financial value out of the business. It starts with that, you know, sort of like that concept uh, of uh, steward ownership that I was talking about at the very beginning. In other words, not extracting the value out of the company through through sales, not through IPOs, you know, also not through dividends. Mohammed Yunus also wrote a great book called Building Social Business, in which he also talks about no dividend companies for solving human problems. Of course, uh, lots of people jumped on Mohammed Yunus's ideas, like, you know, with social enterprise, uh, also with microfinance, but unfortunately, people commercialized those ideas and took it in a direction that he was not entirely intending. 
So anyhow, but the point is, I believe that the key with post-growth entrepreneurship is, first of all, just questioning growth in general, asking the question, is growth good? Not enough people ask this question, you know? And the other thing is uh, we need to ask, you know, is it really necessary and desirable to exit? This stuff is so embedded into the startup ecosystem. It is so embedded into the behavior of the, the ministries <laughs> that, you know, if, when you stop and think about it, this stuff falls apart. The only reason why there is an exponential curve, you know, it, uh, on the PowerPoint slide at your startup bootcamp is because it takes usually about three to five years uh, ideally before you, you know, of exponential growth before you can read the, reach the point when you're, you have to exit. If you're not planning on exiting, you know, you can't keep up exponential growth any longer. I mean, just mathematically speaking, <laughs> the nature of exponentiality is at a certain point it's growing so quickly, it's just not doable. <laughs> so it's not actually about the, you know, <laughs> the, the exponentiality, but it's just about your, 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 you're trying to get to that cutoff point sufficiently quickly uh, for the investors. Now, the problem is, you know, also the investors are pushing us towards VCs as quickly as possible. This capital, first of all, it's not helping companies. It's not helping us to start good, financially viable, independent, and social companies. First of all, the problem when you have capital is that it distracts you from a business model. <laughs> you know, because when you start uh, with money, with a big pile of cash, you are you get good at spending it and you also wind up spending that money on whatever you feel like developing rather than you know what the mark developing what the market wants but really what the idea is is it's sort of like startups are being treated like what we call in dutch a, a puff kit basically a battery chicken you are force feeding your startups investment capital <laughs> to basically make them big and plump and juicy until the moment when they are liquidated which is literally the term that vcs use for the exits you know in which all that value is pulled out of the company and after you know that value is extracted there is just a car there is a almost an empty shell of that company left over. And uh, yeah, and, and basically that this liquidation moment, I mean, one of two things are is happening. One, either you're basically trying to with this exponential growth, you know, and you're basically artificially hiring using investment capital. So you're either trying to turn yourself into an attractive aqua hire for a larger uh, company. So uh, like, a, you know, trying to get yourself bought by Google or something. And at that point, you know, a business model has nothing to do with it. You don't need a business model if you're just trying to hire people with investment cash and get acquired. The second thing is um, with the IPO is, you know, if you're starting with a revenue losing company, <laughs> the fundamentals of that company are unsound. But what you're doing is it's basically a pump and dump scheme. You're hyping that company, which is inherently financially unsound, and you know, with all kinds of publicity and you know, hype and media attention. And then what you're trying to is to do is dump these shares onto the public market. <laughs> you know, and it, it's a question whether or not this pump and dump should even be legal. Um, as long as we're in a growth economy, uh, you know, where basically the, the law of the, the greater fool exists and the greater fool, law of the greater fool basically just means, oh, well, as long as there's a greater fool than me who's, you know, willing to buy these assets at a, at a higher price than what I spent for them. You know, so if you're in a growth economy, that can work. But the moment that things stop growing, <laughs> the whole system implodes, <laughs> you know, and basically the last investor is left holding the bag. See, what people don't get, we celebrate all these unicorns, you know, and it's like we've got Prince Constantine who's like, oh, the Netherlands needs to be a country of unicorns, right? But what people don't understand is that 90% of unicorns are revenue losing. 90%. You know, we just tacitly assume that these, these unicorns at a certain point are going to get enough economies of scale that they're going to start gaining money again. But in 90% of the cases, statistically speaking, this has not worked out that way. And there's, I can provide citations after this uh, for, for anybody basically who's interested. But uh, another thing that most people don't realize 
is that uh, also 80% of VC funds in the last 25 years have failed to keep pace with the stock market. So I was talking about that carry, you know, that, that, that performance incentive. Well, it turns out that the majority of VCs actually don't get a penny of that because they're actually most of their, their startups uh, fail. See, the VCs are actually living uh, off of the fee stream. They're living off of that 2% which basically means that you've got people that are pumping money into these companies. <laughs> uh, at the end of, you know, of the day, basically the companies are failing, the, the, the shares become worthless, you, you the founders are, are losing their businesses. And then, you know, this is of course terrible for them and their personal lives and their families and their ecosystems. And you, you ask the question like, who's winning here? Just the fund managers, that's it, because they're living off of this 2% and they're the only ones that are essentially taking zero risk. <laughs> and they're the ones that are getting pretty much the majority of the upside in the majority of the cases. If we want more you know, evidence of the fact that the startup ecosystem is not working, it is the 90% failure rate of startups. It is well known that 90% of startups fail and only 10% succeed. Why? <laughs> Are we clinging on to a system with a 90% failure rate? You know, we can do better. The Silicon Valley ecosystem is at best only what, like, you know, 40 years old? <laughs> you know, somehow, somehow we managed to start startups before Silicon Valley, before VCs existed. You know, people bootstrapped with launching customers, you know, they actually found customers for the companies, you know, that they were trying to start, you know, and uh, let's make bootstrapping sexy again, you know, and this is sort of a plea, I think, to both people in incubators, but also for startup founders, the next time an incubator tells you, you need VC, you know, to start your company, call bullshit on it, because first of all, you can most of the time easily bootstrap service companies, and you can basically use service companies to cross subsidize the R&D on products. So, you know, it requires lateral thinking. It's a different way of thinking. The other thing that is kind of a bit nefarious is when you ask the question, so you've got these like revenue losing unicorns, like you've got like say WeWork that's spending money five times as fast as it's gaining it from customers. You can ask the question, whose money is it losing? Now here's the sad part. In the US, 60% of VC investments comes from pension funds. So what that means is that money that's getting burned is coming from people like you and me. It's coming from taxpayers. <laughs> In other words, uh, you know, it, it, we, we hope to retire someday. Now you would ask the question, why are pension funds then, you know, historically knowing that 80% uh, of, uh, of VC funds don't match the stock market, why are they all investing in, the, you know, in these VC funds in the first place? Quite simply, it's because right now with the low interest rates, because you've got interest rates that are very close to zero, you know, and in some cases with negative interest, uh, if you just put your money in the bank, um, you know, these, these pension funds and other investment funds, they are desperate for somewhere to put their money to get any kind of returns at all. Because see, they've been promising people like you and me that we're gonna get these returns so we can retire someday. And uh, yeah, so, and they know that they can't get it with more safe investment like bonds and things like that anymore. So they're going into quote unquote riskier investments out of desperation, uh, you know, like, um, like VC funds not really very helpful. Now, this is what's transformative, I think, about things like, like Snowball. It's actually putting a lower fee option on the market, which I can imagine also things like pension funds would find more attractive. And uh, anyway, but uh, the point with all of this is the entire startup ecosystem really has turned into a casino for investors, <laughs> you know, um, but it doesn't have to be that way. Historically speaking, the very first startup incubator was called the Batavia Industrial Center from Batavia, New York. And it wasn't about creating unicorns, but it was rather about revitalizing local economies. So uh, the way that that worked is, uh, you know, I think the, the main industry moved out of town, a bunch of people got laid off and a rich family there had, uh, you know, 
they had a restaurant and a movie theater and they wanted basically people to have enough money to be able to eat at the restaurant and see movies. So what they did is they bought up an empty building and they basically said, well, we're gonna provide uh, resources for um, companies uh, that can basically, uh, and the whole objective you know, is not to become this international explosive success, but they're considered a success if they can graduate and get out of this building and, ha and get onto Main Street and just, you know, to be able to succeed on their own. That was the definition of success. And one of their very first uh, tenants was actually a chicken hatchery. <laughs> and uh, Joe Manusco, uh, who was the founder of um, the Batavia Industrial Center, at a certain point he said to a journalist, well, you know, here they're hatching chickens. Well, gee, you know, they're, they're incubating chickens. I guess we must be incubating startups. So that was actually where the term incubator came from. You know, eventually it evolved to mean something very, very differently. And you started di different and you had these tech incubators, um, you know, particularly of the model following Y Combinator. Now, the founder of Y Combinator, Paul Graham, he wrote a blog post in which he literally says, and I quote, I am a manufacturer of income inequality. And this is the model that we're following. <laughs> so I think that, you know, at, for us as technologists, I think, you know, we need to pay in particular attention that when we're using our tech skills, when we're using our security skills, our crypto skills, you know, really any skill set that we have, know that you have a choice. You know, if you are going to, uh, you know, be aware, first of all, that there's other ways you can use your skills than just going to work for the big players like, like Google and Facebook and Amazon that first. Remember, the startup of today is the larger company of tomorrow. But even beyond that, when you make your startups, understand that you can say no to investors. Understand that you can make your company steward-owned and really build something of social, enduring social value for the long term that is not meant to be sold. Company, you know, understand that business can be one of the most effective forms of activism and business can be a mixed media for art. It can be a vehicle for spirituality or even for creative expression. But we are not taught to think about business that way, not in the incubators and not in the business schools. I mentioned that uh, three years ago, I started Nonprofit Ventures. That's a post-growth startup uh, incubator. We have run basically two cohorts uh, through our programs uh, with roughly a dozen uh, founders per cohort. And we have had everything from uh, sort of post-growth law firms, a post-growth brewery. Uh, we had one lady in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, who was creating basically an event bureau for, uh, for women, but she used the profits from that to cross-subsidize uh, an NGO called Heels for Paths that combats uh, menstrual, menstrual poverty in rural China, uh, sorry, rural Kenya. Uh, we had another guy from, from New Delhi. We had, uh, you know, also a post-growth design firm, you know, and many others. <laughs> so understand that there are alternatives out there and that you do have a choice. You know, you don't have to just accept, you know, what's being offered to you. So anyway, I hope that uh, you all found this uh, interesting and uh, inspiring, and I'm more than happy uh, to answer questions if you have any. Thank you very much, Simone. It was a very inspiring talk. Uh, I, um, I recognize uh, the, um, the, the shareholder activism, actually. The Netherlands has a similar, uh, similar project with uh, another oil company here, yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, I like to quote, the startup of today is the big one of tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> of course, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to check out Snowball Management, uh, Snowball Impact Management. I'm going to see, um, we have some questions coming in. Um, by the way, what I like about the um, what you mentioned, if, you, if the company cannot be sold by this golden ticket uh, construction, it also means that your data cannot be bought over by another company who then can merge mm -hmm. it and do with it what they like. Yeah. A very... Uh, a good um, 
Yeah. See, exits are really horrible for data governance. And this is a problem that we've seen, uh, for example, in the in the, the cybersecurity space. One uh, well-known example is uh, was Fox IT and when they got uh, purchased uh, by the NCC group. Because they had these monitoring black boxes basically throughout the entire Dutch government, Dutch business sector, Dutch military. They wound up getting purchased by NCC group and the entire Dutch government let out a simultaneous Oh shit! <laughs> our, you know our, our data is now owned by the British. Um, so what happened is there was another small startup called Red Sox uh, that had uh, spun off uh, from Fox IT, and they were kind of making similar uh, monitoring black boxes. And basically, uh, what wound up happening was, you know, they of course also had investors, and of course, with all this, you know, all the govern, all these people were jumping ship over to Red Sox. They grew exponentially. Two years later, I read in the paper again, congratulations to Red Sox, they just got acquired by the Romanians. You know, and at a certain point, you just start to wonder, like, when are the when are we going to learn, you know, and, and this is, I think, why steward owned kinds of companies are a matter of national importance, you know, if we care at all about our data governance, if we care at all about our privacy, and not selling things out to, to foreign investors and really to trying to create, create things to cultivate local ecosystems, you know, that I, I think that's what we need right now. And especially post COVID, you know, the Dutch government right now is trying to figure out, you know, how are we going to have this post COVID economic recovery? You know, they even lately had this, um, uh, basically this uh, proposal, this thing called um, the National Crew Funds, so the National Growth Fund, and they were soliciting uh, so-called growth plans for the Netherlands. Uh, the economist uh, Tim Jackson and I uh, had submitted a uh, proposal uh, that basically a post-growth plan that said, you know, have you have you ever thought about whether growth is actually desirable? <laughs> you know, and, and and you know, here are some other things that you could do instead. <laughs> um, you know, and and we need to make these noises because the Dutch government doesn't get it yet. And I, it, it's not that anybody means badly, but it's just that nobody's thought about this yet. And that's why I think it's so important to have this discussion. It's so important to promote this discourse, because until people really start talking about it, you know, when people start asking questions like, why does my why does my incubator have a financial conflict of interest? You know that, in other words, they take equity in their startups, but th this affects what they're teaching. You know, one time I went to uh, Rockstart and uh, said, "Hey, I I'd love to teach you know to a class about uh, post growth entrepreneurship to your founders. I'm not going to charge you a cent for it, but I would just love to do it to teach new uh, kinds of social impact." And they thought about it, and they're like, "Well, you know, but." our investors are investment banks like Merrill Lynch. So yeah, gee, I'm really sorry. You know, we're going to have to politely decline. <laughs> I mean, their own business model is literally in financial conflict with what they're teaching. We need to ask these questions because until we start talking about this, this is not going to get solved. I agree. And so do um, our, our guests, uh, uh, our participants today, I see. Um, a question from a uh, Gregor, team member from uh, SWORM. Mm -hmm. um, very inspiring and very true. <laughs> uh, usually startups will face a lot of pressure to go to the, the VC route. Um, what would you advise founders to do to stand tall and go the way you suggest? Because I can imagine, given the, the original, uh, let's say, uh, uh, discourse, um, there might be an incentive to... to, to, to for security, I would say, if you look at it from a Muslim perspective, for financial security first, somehow. Well, I mean, founders oftentimes tend to go for uh, VC just because it's comfortable, because I mean, it enables you to be able to get a salary from day one, which is comfortable. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I think what's better is just to sort of like hedge your bets while you're making your startup and really not necessarily start work. Don't, don't, don't really rely full time on income from your company until you're, you either, uh, you either need to have money saved up or you need to not quit your day job. <laughs> Let me put it that way, because uh, you need 
you need customers basically to be able to uh, to bring in money and that will pay you, but that's going to, it usually takes a year or two uh, to be able to um, get to that point where it's going to be, uh, it, where you're really going to be able to pay yourself a salary. In the case of Radically Open Security, it took me a year. I was able to do this as a tech person because I had some savings, uh, which most certainly helped. But, um, you know, but there's also, uh, for example, the book um, Originals, where they're, one of the things is they were talking about, for example, uh, companies like Warby Parker, which actually started their company while they were still, you know, one of them was still, at, you know, finishing up his, I think his, his graduate education, and the other guy was still sort of working his, working his job, uh, I think, part time, you know, to make sure there was incoming income coming in. It does mean that you won't necessarily be able to work uh, full time hours at the beginning, but chances are, at the very beginning, you're not going to have enough business <laughs> to be able to do that anyway. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the point is that you can sort of multitask your your old jo day job with uh, sort of the new thing uh, that you're trying to start, you can sort of gradually migrate yourself financially over to the new thing once it's financially able to support it. The problem is people want instant gratification. <laughs> Basically, it's like, you know, I want something and I want it now. So I want my business and it's got it, it's all or nothing. Like it's, it's you know, and again, if you've got enough savings to support that, you, you can do that, you can do it that way. <laughs> um, I did, <laughs> but, uh, but of course that implies you have the savings in the first place. But again, you know, the problem really with this, this big pot of starting with the big pot of money is that, again, you're going to be distracted from the core business, which should be finding your actual value proposition and uh, finding a viable business model. And as long as it, it's the same thing with open source projects, open source projects tend to get a uh, subsidy. And the other problem, and I've spoken with this uh, about, uh, I've spoken with NLNet and also SDN phones about this. One of their big pet peeves is as soon as the, the subsidy runs out, the open source project falls over. <laughs> and the reason why is because uh, founders of open source projects are not commercial and they hate money. <laughs> There's no other way that I can say it. I mean, money, money is evil. Here. Sorry? You dare to generalize here on this? Well, well, look, it depends. I mean, not everybody's the same, but I know a whole lot of academics and open source founders that just do are, are not so hot on capitalism. And quite frankly, they don't want to start companies. They want to run the open source projects, but they don't necessarily want to start companies. But what these people don't realize is if their open source project doesn't have a business model, it's not going to be able to stand on its own two feet. The other thing also is that ideally, an open source project should have users because I mean, what every open source developer wants is they want people who, who are going to be using what they build, <laughs> you know, and, and really, you know, having users, especially paying users that actually validates that what you're creating <clears throat> is valuable enough to people that they want to pay some amount uh, basically to use it. So, um, the European Commission, for example, has hired in uh, nonprofit ventures to help with mentoring some of their tech startups. And our exact niche is basically mentoring tech startups. You don't want to have a business. <laughs> and I know that sounds really strange, but, you know, but really trying to make sure that we can help to embed the continuity in those uh, open source projects in a way that is non-commercial. <laughs> so they can basically have their cake and eat it too. They can ha have the, the, the stability and the financial independence of running a company without that incentivization, you know, the perverse incentivization that comes from playing the Silicon Valley game. So. Yeah, I, I recognize this with uh, projects I've, I've met as well. Yeah. The focus is on the problem to solve and not on the organization around surrounding it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, it's uh, half past four now. I would like to thank you very much for your uh, input. Um, the organizations you mentioned, of course, uh, for anyone, uh, especially in Europe, um, seek them out. Uh, the Foundation NLNet has uh, been very supportive of open source projects in, in the past as well. SDN Fund for any Dutch um, startups. Um, and with that, I'd like to invite you as well uh, for the pitches from the startups on Friday, um, where there will be uh, presenting their uh, ideas to build on a decentralized map. Yeah. And the last thing that I would also like to say is uh, if any of you have any questions, feel free to reach out. So uh, you can con you can connect with me on LinkedIn. 
uh, if you like, uh, feel free to send me a message. Um, you know, I, I respond to most of the messages uh, that I receive, and I'm always sort of friendly and, and, and happy to help and happy to, to answer questions. Please also do keep in mind that in September, also the call for uh, applications is opening for the uh, 2022 cohort uh, for the post growth uh, incubator, post growth entrepreneurship incubator that Nonprofit Ventures is running. Also, feel free uh, to uh, consider uh, submitting to that. And also, if you're connected with me on LinkedIn, you'll get a message, um, uh, a reminder basically when those uh, applications open. Also, if you want more information on this in general, you can have a look at postgrowthentrepreneurship.com. Thank you. That's what I wanted to ask, where do, I, where do they need to go? Yeah. Wonderful.